Welcome to Time On Screen, a new Worn and Wound podcast where we sit down to discuss our love for cinema, time, and watches. Please enjoy our first episode and let us know what you think by leaving us a review on iTunes, leaving us a comment on Instagram, or by emailing info at wornandwound.com. We'd love to hear from you and we hope you enjoy the new series. Thanks for listening. Today's episode is brought to you by Citizen Watch and the ProMaster Collection. Citizen ProMaster timepieces embody the spirit of adventure and represent excellence in design with advanced functionality, durability, and safety, all while respecting the planet they're made to explore. Hello and welcome to the Worn and Wound podcast. My name is Zach Kazan. I'm an editor at the Worn and Wound podcast. We have a special episode for you today, sponsored by our friends at uh, Citizen. Uh, I'm joined by Kyle Snar, head of uh, partnerships at Worn and Wound. Kyle, how are you doing? I am doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. I, you know that I always love talking movies and watches with you, Zach. Well, we uh, appreciate you being here, Kyle. Uh, we are here today, uh, thanks to Citizen, to talk about a movie where Citizen Watch features, uh, I would say somewhat prominently, it's not like the star of the movie, but it's there. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's nice window dressing. Uh, we're talking about The Abyss today, James Cameron's 1989 science, fi- science fiction, I was going to say epic. Would you call this an epic? I don't know. It's not, not really. Call it a science fiction thriller is what yeah, I okay. put it in I there. like that. Yeah. It's yeah. a sci-fi thriller. Um, so The Abyss uh, premiered in the summer of 1989. Um, it was the movie that James Cameron made in between Aliens and Terminator 2, arguably, uh, you know, two more well-known and successful movies, you know, kind of like a generation removed now from when these movies uh, came out. Um, it stars Ed Harris, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, um, and Michael Bean, who uh, was kind of his, um, you know, his, his go-to guy at the time, uh, you yeah, know, starred in, sure. in a string of James Cameron movies, uh, you know, throughout the 80s. Um, and uh, this movie was a, it was a success, but it wasn't, uh, you know, quite the uh, like the James Cameron blockbuster that he would you know become known for, or even that he had experienced previously with the Terminator and with with Aliens. Um, it went way over budget, and we'll talk about some of the like production issues, uh, you know, a little later. Uh, this movie made um, fifty four million dollars in North America, um, worldwide box office total of almost ninety million dollars. Um, so it made a profit, but not a huge one. Um, Kyle, what was your you you're just a little bit older than me. Uh so you probably came to this movie. Oh, we we should do over you're you're reminding me to do a wrist check. Kyle, <laughs> what's on your wrist before we go any further into the uh, into the abyss? Well, yeah, two things here. Number one, I am super stoked to talk about the abyss. I know that it's one of James Cameron's lesser known films, but I have a huge huge love of this movie and we can go into when and why and how and all that good stuff, but um since you asked, Zach, um, I do, <laughs> I do. Uh, I'm wearing uh, a watch that I have a lot, of, uh, a newer watch in my collection that I have a lot of love for. It is the Bulova A11 Hack, and I know that um, Cat Shoulders was on your show recently, sporting the same watch. Sure. And I and I really am super fond of this watch. It's grown on me. It's got that rich kind of um, deep blue uh, dial. It's it's a deep blue, but it's also it's also kind of a a, a royal blue. It's 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 a really yeah. cool, unique color mixed with just like that beautiful pop of red secondhand. And this watch is far more versatile than you would ever expect. It's it's you know it's a field watch style, simple three hander, no date, but like man, it, it feels like it fits into every possible environment. So it's a, it's a great one. What what are you wearing today, Zach? So I'm wearing in the spirit of the uh, of the podcast. I'm wearing my Citizen Pro Master Dive. Uh, watch. This is uh, their. Uh, it's it's their the green uh, dial variant of the ProMaster dive. It has uh, what I think some people refer to as the ashtray style case. Uh, mm. You know, like really kind of like knurled corners, a square case, um, green camouflage dial. Um, it's a uh, it's solar powered watch. It's uh, it's their part of their Eco Drive. Uh, line. Um, it's a really fun, um, you know, fun dive watch. It, it wears surprisingly well given the large dimensions and just like the appearance of it. You wouldn't think that it would uh, be so comfortable to wear, but it's titanium, uh, so it's super lightweight. Um, and it's just a lot of fun, and I think it's an appropriate watch uh, to talk Absolutely. about as we uh, as we uh, get into uh, into the abyss. Uh, as we is, dive um, into the abyss, yeah, we're going to make that pun a bunch so of times, many times, so many times uh, throughout <laughs> the day. Um, 
So uh, just, just as a as a, a forewarning, we uh, you know we're going to be you know spoiling the movie a little bit. Probably we'll be talking about the the plot. I don't know if we'll get into like you know major spoilers, but uh, if you haven't seen The Abyss, maybe watch it before you listen uh, to this episode, just to kind of like familiarize yourself with the uh, you know with the film a little bit. Uh, definitely a movie that's worth seeing anyway. You know, I think we both you know I, I have some reservations about it. You know, sure, but, uh, I think it's certainly them. worth uh, you know worth seeing uh, you know regardless. Uh, um, so, uh, so just, uh, you know, go ahead and, and, and check out the movie before you listen to the podcast, if you haven't seen it, uh, or if you haven't seen it in a while, um, Kyle, you, uh, when, when did you first come to the abyss? Um, you know, what were your earliest kind of like memories of, uh, of, of seeing this movie? Sure, sure, sure. So I, you know, I saw this as a kid, probably likely right when it came out on, VHS at the time, right? So I okay. did not see this in the theaters. I think I was a little young. I was probably 12-ish when this came out. And and it was PG-13. And so I, I think my parents just kind of waited till it came out on video. I think I rode my bike down to Video Bin, which was my local video movie rental joint. And mm-hmm. I was super excited to see this movie because, you know, I, I think even as a kid, I was very, very into movies. I knew directors and I knew that James Cameron had this reputation of making really, let's just go with realistic feeling movies. You know, he really had a sense of details. He has a sense of place. And he like, you know, at the time, you know, was really going into creating these movies that felt like a, a, like a certain degree and level of, of, of realism that I the thought was really cool. And so this yeah. was a, this was an exciting, like I couldn't wait to pop this into the, the VCR and push play. Hopefully mm-hmm. it was rewound when I got it. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, so you hit on something uh, like that, that the, the aspect of, uh, of realism. Um, it's, uh, this movie, I would describe it as really immersive. And again, that's kind of another like water pun, I guess, <laughs> but, um, like you really kind of like feel like you're with these characters, um, you know, on this, underwater adventure and just to kind of like give folks a, you know, maybe who haven't seen the movie, just kind of a broad outline of what it's about. Um, the movie involves, um, a team of, um, like they're basically working on an experimental oil rig, you know, underwater and their, uh, their, their, uh, their oil rig is used by a team of Navy SEALs to investigate a downed, uh, us submarine. And it's kind of like set in the backdrop of, uh, this like kind of cold war, uh, you know, situation and the, you know, the, question is you know would the russians get to the uh where the soviets get to the uh get to the sub before the americans maybe there's some like you know secret technology nuclear weapons on the you know on the sub um so it has this kind of like cold war background a lot of that was cut out from the um from the movie and you can see it in like the director's cut and the deleted scenes uh but it's still kind of there in the theatrical cut just sort of in the background and of course you know there's uh you know, as there is with a science fiction underwater adventure, there's an alien in the in the movie that uh, you know kind of makes its presence felt. And uh, there's a question of whether it's uh, whether it's friendly or whether it's malicious. And uh, you know, the way characters kind of interact with this alien presence kind of becomes sort of like this. Like, uh, the movie becomes a little bit more fanciful as it as it goes on, and you know, kind of departs from that realistic you know aspect. But um, you're always kind of like really in bed with these characters in a very like confined space. And I think that's the thing about the movie that works the best is, um, you know, the, the sense of setting and place is really, really, uh, really well done. Absolutely. And I think it is interesting just kind of talking about when this is, this movie is set, you can tell that it's set in kind of like those type of movie realms where it's like the not too distant future. It's kind of mm-hmm. not today. It's, it's maybe a few years into the future. Technology has progressed a bit since from the present day. The, the interesting and ironic thing about this is this is just this was released months before the Berlin Wall falls, like just right. like two months before the Berlin Walls falls, and you know the Cold War fears at the time were changed dramatically within months of this movie releasing. So it is good that I, I suppose that they trimmed a lot of that out of the theatrical cut because you know does that stand the test of time? Yes and no, but um, it, it's it's a really interesting time period for just you know geopolitical stuff, and this movie mm-hmm. is is that is the backdrop to what, what's going on here. 
Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. So I came to this movie a little bit later than than you did. I didn't see it until I was, I think, probably in college or like a little mm. little after when I started to kind of really getting interested in movies. Like it was always kind of like a presence on the video and cable, you know, when I was growing up, you know, in the in the nineties. Um, but for whatever reason, I never, um, I just never watched it. And so mm-hmm. I saw, I came to this movie after having seen a bunch of other James Cameron movies, certainly both Terminator movies and aliens. And uh, I'm sure Titanic had been out, um, you know, by the time I saw this movie in true lies. So basically like every other James Cameron movie yeah, I had yeah. seen, um, you know, before Piranha two or no. this one, you know what? <laughs> I still have, we, we, we'll have to have the Piranha two conversation on another <laughs> podcast. I still haven't seen the Piranha two. Um, yeah, I neither have I, no big yeah, deal. <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, his, uh, his, his very first movie, I think, um, yeah, not very, this, one of these things is not like the others. It's, it's right, 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 right. In the exactly. James Cameron filmography. Yeah. Um, so I came to this, you know, after you know later, a little bit later in life. I wasn't a kid, you know, when I saw it, and after having seen, you know, every other James Cameron movie, and um, it really does feel like a different kind of James Cameron movie. It's not, um, you know, it doesn't have like the spectacle of um, of Terminator Two or of of Titanic. Um, it's, it's kind of, um, like a smaller, it feels like a smaller scale piece, uh, for, sure. for him. Um, but it still had, uh, you know, like very advanced special effects. Um, and I think a level of, of production difficulty that I certainly didn't appreciate when I saw it when, you know, in my early twenties or, or whatever. And we'll talk more about that. Um, cause it's kind of what the movie is like notorious for, but, um, it, you know, for me, it, it always felt like kind of a lesser, Cameron movie. And I don't know that it's, uh, you know, upon rewatching it, you know, for the purposes of this podcast, it hasn't like really, you know, been raised in esteem necessarily for me, but I think I appreciate like what he was able to cobble together a little bit more, just knowing how difficult this movie was to make. Yeah. I, I, I totally get that. It, when you, you see it with the 13 year olds brain, it really mm-hmm. is, um, pretty amazing. I, I think it, I like the, the small kind of conf- confines of this of this movie where it sticks you into these tight spaces that are oftentimes filling with water mm-hmm. actually filling with water as, as you're yeah. seeing it go down i love this notion of you know you kind of get this out of ridley scott's alien but like you know ridley scott's alien is like truckers in outer space you know and they're yeah. like put put this this crazy thing happens to them this is kind of almost like the equivalent where it's kind of like truckers underwater including yeah. a guy who wears a trucker hat the entire yeah. time who also sport sports the, the citizen in this particular that's our guy uh, yeah, that's our that's yeah, our yeah. Guy. And, yeah yeah and it's and i i love that you know i when i was a kid i literally recognized no one in this movie other than chris elliott who makes a weird kind of cameo and plays yeah. the same the same bumbling kind of guy as he does in groundhog's day essentially <laughs> but um yeah but like Ed Harris, I think this was his first big role to, to my knowledge as a kid. You know, I'd never seen him in anything else. I didn't recognize any of the other actors, except I finally realized that um, the, the guy with the mustache was Michael Bean, like after several sure, watches, yeah. you know, because he kind of, he's, he plays a bad guy. He's got this funny mustache. He's not instantly recognizable as, as the character you loved in, you know, uh, you know Aliens or in Terminator. But um, what I think is awesome about this is the fact that he brought these people who were kind of unknowns. I think at least one of the guys was a professional deep sea diver. He wasn't even an actor. He just was one of the crew members was just a, a diver that they got to know. And he, they put him on the, on the, the cast and the crew. And it was, for me, I loved that, that, that notion of just bringing you into this world that I had not ever seen anywhere else. This was like a picture into something I didn't know existed is this world yeah. of, professional deep sea diving and like this and like kind of all of the the uh i loved the gear of this movie like there's so much, so much gear, gear. Yeah. and so many kind of gadgets and vehicles and all of it seemed not sleek really rough and tumble held together with like you know bubble gum and spit and yeah just this like very cool um technologically advanced, but like really gritty and, you know, pipes everywhere and, you know, big bay doors that you have to like crank shut. And that the notion of like, um, 
the realism of those details like just grab me hook line and sinker and 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 yeah. we're obviously going to talk about watches but that level of attention to detail absolutely extends to the watch casting in this film yep. to a really strong 100%. degree and i vividly remember getting imprinted as a kid with that is a cool watch of the yep. particular one that I'd like to talk about the most, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything in this movie, uh, and I think this is true for most Cameron movies, like all of the set dressing, like all the little details are, they feel like very like handpicked by him to, to, to blend in seamlessly. Like you really believe that everything about this little, you know, this little world that these characters inhabit um, is real. If even though, like it's not like there isn't a you know there are underwater dwellings that divers use but like nothing quite like this um, yeah. and there are dive suits you know obviously that divers use saturation divers use but not like this like they were invented Correct. like for this movie but it, like they still kind of feel real and um you know I, I think like the diving is something that's worth like um you know pointing out because Cameron's a diver you know Cameron is an ambassador for another watch brand and famously, you know, has a watch that's kind of like, you know, like named after him and his watch, you know, with that brand. And he takes diving seriously. And, you know, he spent a good chunk of his career, you know, underwater, you know, he, you know, he made Titanic, he made a documentary about Titanic. There's a documentary about this movie, um, you know, that is, uh, you know, largely filmed underwater. So like he takes this stuff really seriously. And I think that that's important um, to, uh, you know, to, to understand about this movie is that, um, like it's, this isn't like, he's not like just kind of like doing research for a project. Like he is a diver and he understands, you know, this world in a pretty intimate way. I mean, he directed this movie, any scene underwater, he's underwater also directing the scene yeah. in a, in this kind of specialty dive suit they invented so that they could speak to one another while submerged in that's hard helmet kind of mic'd up way. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that, I think he's also himself just like explored the ocean yeah. just out of pure exploration and, and a love of the sea. I think he's gone pretty deep into certain trenches and, and he, yeah, he's, oh, yeah. A he's legit been on submarines and yeah, he's done all that, all, all that stuff. I think he's a pretty, yeah. I mean, some of it, I, you know, obviously is, you know, for like cross promotional purposes to like sure. make sure people see this one. But like, I, I totally, you know, buy that he has a, like a genuine interest in this, um, you know, in this stuff and, um, and takes it very seriously by all, by all accounts. He, uh, you know, he does for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see it and feel it. I think in this film, it's like the, that, that again, that attention to detail is so evident. It's so, um, it's persuasive too, as and it, you know, it, it makes you feel like you're really in a place you haven't been before. Oh yeah. And it sure. doesn't feel like anything's being faked, which is really, really groovy. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you find yourself kind of wanting to live down there with these guys when you were, <laughs> when you were watching this movie, maybe not as an adult, but like as a kid, did you sort of like want to like be a part of this adventure? Did it like give you that? Yeah. Sort of sense? Yeah. I, I, again, like, you know, I think it's cool when, you know, you, when you see movies about outer space in, in the future, people all, all kind of wearing this sleek kind of zip up space uniform and everyone looks the same. But what I loved about this this world is that they're in they're in jeans and you know you know plaid shirts and trucker caps and cowboy boots yeah. and they are and, and cowboy hats you know they're just kind of like doing their thing down there. This is the this is the day job and and they have almost like accepted and like almost like take for granted how adventurous they are as 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 this crew of this of this underwater uh, drilling platform you know and they and that's I love that I love that vibe of just like this this team who's been through a ton you can tell that they they love each other they've been through all this all this um it, you know hard times together they've been through rough stuff but there's like zero you know flashbacks there's no exposition about yeah. you know their adventures together you just feel that this crew is tight knit and they've been they've been through it together and that's a really cool thing to uh be able to communicate with like basically no uh, exposition to explain that these guys are, um, you know, really uh, best pals. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, do you have a favorite scene uh, in the movie, Kyle, or a favorite section? I, of the movie? I do. You know, I think um, again, this is where we maybe get into a little bit of of spoilerville. You know, yeah, but spoiler um, away. you know, I one of the scenes that is just shocking it was shocking to me the first time I saw it, and it's really kind of powerful every time I see it. Is there's a sequence when. Um, our two kind of 
leads, um, you know, Ed Harris and his and his significant other are stuck in a sub mini sub that has a has sprung a leak, mm-hmm. and it's you know frigid seawater is is pouring into this mini sub, and they have one helmet like scuba scuba or I guess like hard helmet setup, and they're trying to figure out what to do. And they finally figure out that, you know, if he wears the suit and she allows herself to drown in drown in the Arctic waters, that he, since he's a better swimmer and he's more adept under, under sea, he could pull her quickly over to, from the mini sub to the main, the, you know, the main platform mm-hmm. and revive her. And that's that's the plan, and it is a shockingly like thrilling scene. And it, it like you, I don't think there's any kind of movie scene that I've ever seen that that really kind of depicts what drowning could look and feel like, and how mm-hmm. scary it is. And um, when you also realize and and kind of um, watch the the making of stuff, and that they, you know, they they. They had her hold her breath and being dragged underwater <laughs> so he, they could capture the shots of them, him tra- traversing the floor of the ocean with her mm-hmm. uh, in tow. It's her without any air supply. And then, you know, they, they run for 30 seconds or a minute and then say cut and then quickly give her um, her air supply. And you're just like, so, so basically the risk here was as high as you can possibly imagine of someone really getting you know, not coming out of this. Someone without, drowning. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was, yeah, it was going to be drowned. rough. And yeah. that whole sequence, um, is sh- so powerful and just blew my mind as a kid and blows my mind every time I see it. And I think again, like it's, that's where like the thriller aspect definitely, you know, takes this whole movie up a few notches in my book in terms of just, you got your regular sci-fi, which, you know, you could, there's a lot of things that this movie has in common with like, Close Encounters of the Third Kind or, Mm -hmm. you know, other kind of like sci-fi, you know, alien style movies. But this just has these scenes of like, of like true peril that were perilous to the actors in filming them that, that I think still holds up really, really well. Yeah. um, That's a great scene. It leads into um, what I think is maybe like the most, like it's certainly like the most brutal scene in the movie where uh, Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio's character is like is resuscitated by yeah. Ed Harris, um, and this scene is because in a you know in retrospect is you know kind of been it's a little controversial just because of the the toll it took on Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio, but um, it is. Um, it almost like it's a, it's a great scene. It's really well executed, but it almost seems out of place to see you know like Ed Harris and you know like this crowd of divers kind of hovering over her, uh, you know, working so hard to resuscitate her. It is like really, um, I don't know if thrilling is the right word. Like I actually found it's it like jarring. Almost, it's pretty it, yeah. It's like it's almost like a, like borderline upsetting. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a there's a point where you know, it looks like she's dead, and he literally like slaps her. <laughs> You know, yeah. across the face and is like pounding on her chest. And it's um, it's 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 hard to watch. And it was a scene that, um, you know, uh, reportedly, um, you know, led to Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio walking off the set and, you know, just saying it was, uh, you know, it was too too brutal for her. And if, if you look closely in the like the editing of that scene, um, you'll see Ed Harris kind of like screaming um you know, at Mariel's with Master Antonio, but she's not there because she had already walked off the set. So he's like screaming and screaming at nothing. Um, so it's uh, like that. Yeah, that whole section is really, um, you know, really intense. And I think certainly like the emotional climax of the um, of, of the movie. It's um, it's 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 really well done, um, but also kind of illustrates the like insane nature of the production really well just for like the the, the high degree of difficulty in making yeah. the movie what what was your favorite scene zach so i really love the um the entire sequence uh, uh that really goes from the the team first kind of exploring the montana the downed mm-hmm. sub all the way through um the section where the uh where the the crane uh you know topside collapses because of course I, we haven't mentioned this yet there's a hurricane Oh, just, you know, just a hurricane at the same time. Yeah. So the, the movie takes place in, uh, um, 
I guess like in the Bahamas, I, I want to say, um, you know, uh, that's like the, the geographic region we're, we're dealing with here during hurricane season. And, um, and so, yeah, so they're, they're exploring the, uh, you know, the, the sub and, you know, they come across dead bodies and, um, you know, there's real diving, you know, happening here. Um, and yeah, you really kind sure. of, it's like a, um, it's a really good kind of like sustained, um, like suspense slash action sequence where like you don't really know what they're going to encounter and like the technical filmmaking is just really impressive, you know, to me. And then it goes right into the sequence where, um, where this, the crane, uh, you know, topside, you know, collapses and falls and it's just really great action movie filmmaking. And I think that that, yeah. that stretch is, it's like a, you know, probably about like a half hour or so. Uh, and runtime, I think it just like it flows together really well, and it's really fun to watch. And like to me, that is kind of um, the most closely related sequence to like what I like most about James Cameron and his ability to stage these like large scale, um, you know, large scale action scenes, um, you know, uh, in a really kind of uh, like effortless way. Even though, of course, it's not effortless. There was a ton of it's hugely complicated because he really did all this stuff. Um, but I, I love yeah, that I sequence. I agree that that is a that is a wildly cool kind of roller coaster ride, you know. And just when you think everything's safe, the next thing kind of happens and leads. To, yeah. You know, and then you think, just okay, like now one, now they're one fine. thing on top of another, and um, just uh, this idea of like kind of like escalating, um, uh, you know, like escalating problems. Uh, yeah. And it, it happens like early in the movie, and so I'm like I'm kind of thinking too, especially on rewatch, like this is sort of like the action peak of the movie in a lot of ways. And like, we still yeah. have like, we still have like over an hour left, you know, in, in, in runtime. And so, um, it's a really interesting filmmaking choice that he makes to, um, to kind of like front load a lot of this, um, a lot of this, like kind of more like Cameron esque action stuff, and then do some of the more, uh, ethereal exploring, you know, after the fact. Yeah, and I think that sequence also has what I would say was kind of like the most kind of Spielbergian moments in it. Mm -hmm. The one that pops out to me is earlier in the film, you see Ed Harris, um, you know, who's going, either has had a divorce or going through a divorce of, you know, his 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 romantic interest later in the film. Um, he tosses his wedding ring in in the toilet and he's like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm done with this. And he tosses it and then, you know, he leaves the bathroom and then he, you see him come right back in and stick his hand in with kind of like the bluish kind of almost like airplane toilet water, yep. fish out the ring with, and now has a blue hand, but slides the ring back on. And then, you know, as topside goes haywire and, and starts dragging around the rig and things start breaking and water starts flooding, you know, it is of course that wedding ring that is the thing that allows him to stick his hand in a door that's being shut and, it stops on his exact wedding ring that he mm -hmm. had previously just tossed in the toilet. And that's a great little moment. I think in reality, that probably would have just chopped his fingers right off, let's be honest. I think so, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I think what is um, cool about that moment, too, is is um, I, I as I rewatched that last night, and I don't know if this was any sort of a impact on my wedding ring choice years ago when I was married, but it looks just like my wedding ring. It's the same width, it's the same exact style. And I think that must have just seeped into my subconscious. And when I, you know, when I chose or kind of designed my wedding ring with my with my wife or my fiance at the time, um, it must have seeped in because it looks identical. Like like it's the same freaking ring. Um well I mean it just it deepens your connection to the, to the yeah. Yeah, so I there you go. There you go. Um is there anything in this movie uh, for you, Kyle, that, uh, you know, that doesn't hold up? So this movie was made, you know, obviously this is like, you know, late 80s, totally different sure. style of of filmmaking. Uh, does any of it feel dated or, uh, or Yeah, or you know, it is, it anyway? again, like it depends on which cut you watch. You know, I, I watched the special edition. I kind of rewatched the special edition mm -hmm. cut for, for this. And there's things that they put into the special edition that I really do like. Um, more alien stuff. But like... The other thing that, like you alluded to earlier, is they weave in the Cold War plot more and more and more. Yeah. And that that was very, very relevant at the time, but it's hard, I think, for people to connect to it now. Sure. It doesn't feel, you know, maybe it's becoming more relevant, who knows, but but it it feels like it distracts from this cool, tight-knit little world that we're stuck in. And I feel like the movie would have been far more powerful if we just you know, if, if we didn't ever 
maybe if we didn't ever even leave the confines of this little world, maybe if we had just even communicated with the guys topside in a very kind of audio or video way and we never, the, the camera never went there, it would be far more interesting if everything was contained in this, you know, underwater world. Yeah, it really, um, it really changes the stakes in a pretty major way when you factor in, you know, all the all the Cold War stuff, and like you think about this, you know, kind of like what seems like when in the theatrical cut, kind of like in this isolated thing, right? Like you know, it's like this team of people, you know, investigating this sub, having this run in with this, uh, you know, with this alien presence that they don't really know anything about, you know, until literally like the very last scene in the movie where you know things kind of finally like reveal themselves. It takes it from like a like what I think is a pretty intimate, you know, little story told on a pretty grand scale into um, like something very different, like a you know like a a a, a much more a, a much grander kind of like you know story about geopolitics and, and humanity know, making it and, yeah making yeah. It, Cameron's making a statement about you know like uh, kind of like the state of the world or something and um, it makes a huge difference uh, you know to whether you whether you uh, you know kind of like dial into that Cold War stuff or 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 focus more on the um, like on the characters and then what they're going through. This week's episode is brought to you by the Citizen Watch ProMaster Collection. Built on Citizen's century-long technological research and innovation, the ProMaster Collection represents professional-grade sports watches. Built for sea, land, and air, each watch is designed to overcome the elements and empower the wearer to go deeper, go further, and go higher. To learn more about the Citizen ProMaster and explore the collection, head to citizenwatch.com. Um, what do you think of the um, the special effects um, in the film? This movie won an Academy Award for uh, for special effects. Uh, how do you think those uh, hold up in the movie? Because it has some very like I what I would say are iconic special effects. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, special effects. Yeah, and I think special effects can be were done in multiple ways. You know, there was a ton of miniature work that went into this film. There was a ton of you know in camera actual like special effects like they're doing you know, underwater and, and mm-hmm. things that are like happening um, in camera that are, that are still considered special effects. And then there's also, and I think this may be what you're alluding to. There's like some of the first big CGI moments ever on film happened in the abyss. And this again was, yeah. you know, I think a lot of people think of Terminator two being the movie that where special effects took the front seat and, and, and they did for sure because they became one of the main characters, the villain in that movie, like really embodied those special effects. But all of that stuff was pioneered. Um, you know, the T-1000 technology was really pioneered in this movie um, yep. with a particular uh, scene that utilized, um, you know, where you learn that the aliens, and again, these aliens might be from outer space or they might just be from really, really deep. I think that's never that's never right. established that they either came here or they were always here sort of vibe. So we say aliens, but like they could very well be, you know, supposedly having lived on our planet longer than we have or something like right. that. But they they can manipulate water and they use, they use this technology to show them manipulating water in what's called the water tentacle scene. And um, I think what I love about James Cameron for the most part is like he – absolutely uses technology to service the story. It's rarely mm-hmm. just the other way around, you know, and he 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 can show off a little bit with his technology, but it generally moves the plot forward and I think it's a really powerful scene. It still feels pretty legit, you know, I think that's one of the things I love about early CGI is that they they were so nervous that no one was going to buy it, so they over rotated hard on making sure that it just looked amazing. That's why Things movies like Jurassic Park hold up so well still because they were, were yeah. so worried that people wouldn't buy into it that they made sure that there was no you know le- stone left unturned and I think that's true in T two and then I think it's true in this movie as well. Yeah, um, I disagree slightly that uh, I, I think on on the uh, the notion that it, that it, that the the aesthetic of it like still looks great. Like to yeah, me, sure. it like this, like the abyss walked. So T2 could run. It's kind of like how I, there you go. That's a good way it. to put like, it. Um, like to me, the, uh, you know, that, like that water, you know, creature scene, which I think is like, you know, like the iconic, like special effects sequence in the movie. Um, like th- that looks like something that, you know, from my perspective now was made in the eighties. But when I watched T2, 
like it still looks great. Like I still think that that looks great. Like he really like perfected something um, in between the abyss and Terminator two. And to your point, like Jurassic park, which came after, um, uh, after T2, uh, you know, still looks fantastic. And like a, a lot of the really like most well done special effects movies from like, you know, the, like that early nineties period still hold up really well. Like the, the best ones, yeah, um, yeah. you know, hold up really well. Then um, there's a whole, this one, there's a whole like 10 year run of really bad special effects in movies. After sure. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this looks like kind of like the beta version of that to me, like it still looks cool. And like, I imagine if you were seeing that, if you saw this in a theater in 1989, like your, your mind was probably blown, you know, by this, um, and it's still, to your point, like really serves the story. And I think that's ultimately like, you know, why this movie kind of, you know, remains, you know, for the most part, a success, you know, years and years later is because the effects aren't like bogging things down and it like it moves things along. Um, but I was really struck just, you know, watching it at home. You know, I have a nice TV, but it's not like, you know, like the nicest, you know, TV. It just it looks, uh, you know, it looks to me like it has like some some 80s vibes in the that sure, 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 sure. Totally. Unavoidable, I guess. It was the 80s. Yeah, yeah. All, so. Well, and I like yeah. that, um, you know, you learn that th- when you do see the aliens, that they're actually like puppets. Like mm-hmm. they actually created puppets to do that and and miniatures to do some of the um, the scenes of the mini subs crashing into each other. They used this really yep. cool technology that they had little projectors inside of these quarter scale or whatever mini subs that were projecting the the, the, the people who are supposedly driving them onto the the little bubble at the be- at the front of each of these mini subs, and that's just like really cool in camera effects that I think yeah. really hold up and look kind of kind of amazing when you think about the technology at the time. Yeah, and um, I think like the aliens themselves, like they look they look great. Like I think those like visually are like really um, like inventive. They look like these little kind of like glow in the dark machines. Yeah, um, yeah. and uh, like just like the like the the colors that Cameron is is using, um, you know, are just like really like imaginative and inventive. And I think uh, that stuff holds up uh, holds up really. Yeah, well the other thing that doesn't hold up is Chris Elliott. Let's be honest. Oh man, so I disagree with you on that too. I like <laughs> I like Chris Elliott in this. I think Chris Elliott's That's fun. I love it when like, he's like. He's like the guy who basically runs all the technology on the entire ship. He's either in charge of, you know, in charge of the crane or he's in charge of the radar and he's just twisting knobs left and right. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty kind of funny. like a Barney Fife energy. To, there you go. To, okay. To okay. Character. You've won me over. He, he holds <laughs> so, up. He holds up. I mean, so where, where would this have been? And I didn't do any research on this, but where was, where was this in Chris Elliott's career? Had he been in a movie b- before this? Um, you know? I mean, he was in, this came out before he was in. Grand Hogs Day, but then he had like a short run TV show. I I don't know. I I he wasn't like was a, early. I mean this was early. People in 1989 weren't like, oh, there's Chris Elliott. Mm, he was no, just no, no, a guy. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we could look back years later and like, oh, Chris Elliott, and he like he yeah. does look. Yeah, you know, he looks like a baby in this movie. Like he's very <laughs> he's very young. Um. So before we get to uh before we get to watches and maybe like ranking the the Cameron movies, I just want to go through some of the um kind of like more wild like production stories from from this movie because like it yeah. really is. I think if people haven't seen The Abyss or haven't seen it for a while, they they might be more familiar with stories from the production and like how notorious this was as like a difficult movie to make than even the movie itself. It's one of those kind of situations. Where yeah. Heart story of darkness of sort of. Yeah. Yeah. It's thing. like an apocalypse now sort of situation where like the story of like making the movie is like, has almost like superseded like the movie, um, the movie itself. So initially Cameron wanted to like shoot this all like on location in scare quotes, like, you know, like in the ocean and then re- realize like tech, like, from a technical perspective, like he couldn't do that. So he had to shoot it like, you know, in these enormous tanks. Um, And they created a studio basically out of this abandoned nuclear power plant with multiple tanks, Um, which to that point, the largest statement. (laughs) Yeah. Like, and like with the cold war content of the movie, even kind of like in the background, it's just like, you know, a fascinating, uh, fascinating location to shoot these this movie. So that was done in South Carolina, uh, kind of like a makeshift um, studio in the, with these like enormous, um, enormous tanks and an abandoned nuclear power plant. Um, the production was delayed from the very beginning. The main tank uh, was not ready for filming on schedule. When it was ready for filming, it sprung a leak. It was just like you know, kind of like one problem after another um, in uh, in making the movie. 
um, the actors really, you know, dove. They went through dive training um, and filmed a lot of these scenes like underwater. Um, you know, they were at uh, they were at depth. Um, you know, uh, for for hours at a time. Um, I mean, they were up. To, they were down there sometimes as on big days as much as ten hours. They were yep. just underwater. Yep. <laughs> Um, and most of the cast, uh, you know, my understanding was not, um, was not deep enough for, um, you know, for like for decompression sickness to be a concern, but Cameron was Cameron and a lot of the crew were, um, you know, at depth, uh, such that they had to take into consideration, um, uh, you know, decompression sickness and they would breathe, you know, pure oxygen for periods of time to, yeah. um, you know, to, uh, to mitigate that, which is, um, you know, mind chaining, like very, very dangerous, you know, to, totally, to do totally. when you're kind of like, you know, given like the unpredictable nature of, of, you know, filming a movie like this. Um, it seemed like there, it seems like there was a lot of like legitimate danger, you know, involved in the making of this movie. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about this, but I think, you know, he, you got the impression that he wasn't this like relentless guy on set who's screaming at everyone, but that he had this vision that he kind of convinced everyone to go along with this ride. And there were certainly mm-hmm. moments it seems like, and again, mm-hmm. I, I watched this hour long documentary that they make on the making of this film, which by the way, there's some amazing watch spotting in that as well amongst the crew who's filming yeah. this whole thing and the dive, the divers who were there to protect, you know, the, the, to rescue and protect um, the cast who got rescued and protected numerous times through the, the making of this film. But um, yeah, I think he just convinced everyone of the, of the vision and, and really like what it would take to, to make something that the way he wanted to, he saw it in his head. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the innovation that came out of the, the filmmaking that the, the the pure technology and, and invention of of new things just to kind of pull off what was in his head I think is that's always a treat intrigued me and I think that's really cool but at the same time you're like this guy also kind of was like there's there's actually moments in the making of documentary where you know you you see like Ed Harris is just totally spent and like has gone through like really really rigorous moments and he's like what you good all right let's do it again and it's just like very little like like yeah. um touchy feely moments there he's 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 on a mission you know yeah um so i mean ed ed harris eventually uh the the the, the production was so fraught there were rumors after the movie was shot that ed harris wasn't going to participate in um promoting the movie mm. um this was a six month shoot um, you know, would, you know, was over scheduled six months is an incredibly long time, uh, to do principal photography on a movie. Um, there were, the actors worked 70 hour weeks. Um, Ed Harris was quoted as saying, I'm never talking about it and never will about, uh, about the movie. Like he eventually did do, uh, publicity, uh, for the movie, but he really hasn't, um, you know, like discussed it since. And same with Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. Um, she's quoted as saying the abyss was a lot of things fun to make is not one of them. And uh, if you can just imagine the hours that she probably spent lying on her back during that resuscitation scene being, you know, slapped by Ed Harris, you know, like I imagine that like really took a toll on her and on Ed Harris. And um, it, I can imagine it wasn't fun to make, but um, you you know, to your point, Cameron was able to convince this group of actors, uh, you know, of a you know particular vision for this movie. And, um, and they did it. And Cameron, I think, would continue, you know, to do that. You know, he's had other movies since, which are, you know, similarly difficult. You know, Titanic also shot, you know, largely, you know, not to the extent of The Abyss, but a lot of the movie was shot underwater and in water. Um, you know, there's a quote also Cameron said, um, I knew this was going to be um, a hard shoot, but even I had no idea just how hard. I don't ever want to go through this again. So he said that in 1989, but then he did go through it again with with Titanic, and then uh, you know with Avatar, which had its own production, uh, you know, issues. He's just like a very ambitious, large scale filmmaker, and he almost like can't help himself from putting him putting himself and his cast and crew in these situations that are um, just like really, really challenging. Yeah, I think the scene that kind of I think think exemplifies this the most is the scene where. Ed Harris is gone, needs to go ultra deep diving. And so yeah. the Navy SEALs introduced him to this technology, which is like saturated breathing. It's like oxygenated. Is that a word? Not, I don't yeah, think oxy- it's, yeah, it's, it's a real uh, thing too. Oxygenated. You- <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. It's like you, you breathe in liquid so that essentially it's like kind of almost like a resin's top, top type five watch, you know, like the yeah, oil filled yeah. watches that where, you know, they don't, they don't, uh, 
have pressure issues because they're filled with liquid. And so the idea right. is you fill, instead of filling your lungs with air, which will be a problem at super deep depths, you fill it with liquid that you breathe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously that's it's a real thing, but like this was also like a super experimental thing. And Ed Harris basically does scenes where he's essentially drowning himself to capture the shots they need. And yeah. I mean, it's it's a brutal thing to watch um, in in the making of behind the scenes documentary where you're just like, wow, this guy is putting his life on the line in, in ways that you just, I mean, it's not. I don't know if it's worth it, but it was. It's a, yeah. it's amazing. It's cool, but wow, you're you're essentially flirting with death in real, real, real ways. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. Um, before we get to the watches, where does this rank in the James Cameron filmography for you, Kyle? Oof. I'm, I'm going to put it up there for me. I mean, I think it's probably number four for me. Okay. Like, what, I, what, so I, what are your top three? Top three, I'm definitely, I'll start at number three. I think that I'm going to go with number three is probably, ooh, this might be number three now that I think about it. Oh, I don't wow. know. I, okay. I really like it. I mean, I think Titanic and Avatar are both have their merits, but I put this up higher than... All right, here we go. I'm going to go. It's number four, and I put okay. above it Terminator, and above that Terminator 2, and above that Aliens. That's me. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a respectable ranking. I, I probably, I think I rank Titanic a little bit higher than you. I'm a Titanic fan. I think, like... It's it's great. I, I, I love it's it. Like, it's I, just, a, I think people rag on that movie a little, uh, little more than they should. Like, it is, like, James Cameron's version of, like, classic old-school epic filmmaking... The special effects still hold up. Um, I think it's uh, still like incredibly watchable. Like, it's not a great. I, not, I'd like, put that. Mostly, you know, I put that number five for me. Number five. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. I for me like T two just like stands alone. Like it's like it's my favorite James Cameron movie, and it's like so high above like everything else. Like it's almost not even fair to to rank uh, like his other movies against there you it. Go. Um. I just I love Terminator two like formative like action movie from my from my youth. Um. Just like. A, incredibly good like we said earlier i think the the special effects in that movie still really hold up um incredibly well it's one of those like comfort movies for me that like i can return to over and over again and that's a funny um, comfort just, movie but yeah because yeah, it's like cool. really like it's very dark if you really like think too yeah, much yeah. About the plot. it's a very dark movie yeah. um aliens similarly i think is uh incredibly rewatchable and just like the action scenes are just so well staged and um the alien franchise is maybe like my favorite film franchise like yeah. i just I, i'm a huge fan of those movies in general um and this movie is like there's almost something like quaint about this movie i don't mean that as a dig but it's like um uh, you know like we were kind of discussing earlier it's like it's it's an uh, a large production uh you know a lot very complicated but it still feels like a more intimate smaller scale piece from cameron and i don't think he'll ever make another movie as small as this so i wish he would honestly i think it would yeah. be cool but you're right i don't think he will either <laughs> Yeah, no, he's making like five Avatar sequels. Exactly. They're all going to be enormous, you know, 3D, yeah. you know, productions. So, all right. It's a watch podcast. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the watches. Um, let's do it. Yeah. So what do you, what do you make of the, uh, the, the citizen watch in this movie? Kyle? Yeah. Like one of the reasons I was super excited to do this podcast and, 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 you know, to talk citizen today is like the, I remember vividly the character of catfish, you know, he's kind of the, the trucker member of the team. He's like the, the rough and tumble dude. And, and there are multiple scenes where his watches, his Aqualand is, is very prominent. And again, in this world that's set in the not too distant future, I had never seen a watch like that. Um, at the time it looked futuristic. It looked, it looks really, uh, you know, unique and stands out it and i think most a lot of that is because of the case shape and mm-hmm. the the you know the depth sensor that it, that protrudes from kind of like the the left hand side of the case yep. um it it just really um is a unique watch and 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 you know i think you know ed harris obviously has a pretty pretty prominent dive watch on as well but his flies under the radar by comparison because again like the aqualand just has such a distinctive like iconic shape to it that you can't miss you know and and having rewatched it more recently and in kind of being in the watch world you know you can see the the, the rubber strap has the famously printed um depth 
uh, chart on on it, mm-hmm. and you can see it in the film. You can see it vividly printed on it in multiple scenes, which I also I don't know if I picked up on that little aspect as a kid, but I love that that it was visible in the film. And you know, for me, that that really is just one of those bits of watch casting that gives you a sense of place. It puts it this. It was a type of watch that puts you into some. It looks real. It looks not like a space age prop or anything. It looks like this actual thing, but it also looks unique and a little bit foreign and and made me feel like there's this was a, a place outside of the, this regular world. And to the fact that it was something that you could go buy at the time, it just is awesome. And it's like a really cool yeah. bit of watch casting, that attention to detail, the attention to, to me, it really fit that character really well, which again, like whenever a prop can like help support the vibe of a character, it's a great thing. So that in combination with his red trucker hat and stuff like that just really brings that character of Catfish alive to me. Um, so yeah, that's it's it is for me a great watch casting moment in, in yeah. all of filmdom. It's uh yeah no it's it's up there. It's really so it's very subtle. Like this is not a um you know Catfish the the Catfish character is a very much a supporting. Yep, character, you know, in the film is this is not like the main guy by any means. And like the watch doesn't like, you know, scream out at you for attention. It's just kind of there. Um, yep. and you notice it and it just feels like part of his, you know, like uniform, I guess. Like um yeah, it totally. just seems totally um, you know, totally of a piece with that character. Um, it's very cool. Like it has a you know, obviously it has a very distinct, you know, look to it with, with the depth gauge and the rubber strap. And um, you know, Citizen is kind of um, like they're on a bit of a roll, you know, right now. And this, this, yeah. you know, watches that look, you know, like this, like the next generation of this watch, the current generation of this watch is, you know, really having a moment um, right now. Um, and you can really see its heritage in like this movie kind of like captured, you know, like forever, as long as people will be watching this movie for, you know, as long as people watch movies. And it's like a little time capsule of, you know, like this, you know, how this watch, you know, might have existed in this fantasy world. You know, in the yeah, absolutely, uh, you know, in the 1980s. So, um, yeah, so it's very cool watch casting. The thing, the other thing I like about the the watch casting in this movie, um, not just with this, um, you know, with the citizen, but with the other watches that characters are wearing, is that there are no like obvious luxury watches in this totally. movie. Um, you know, everything is is like a, a, a every watch in this movie feels correct. You know, for these characters, I think a lot of times in movies as a watch person, I'm always, I'm, you know, I just have, ex- have accepted that I'm going to be distracted, you know, <laughs> by looking mm-hmm. at watches, uh, you know, in movies. And a lot of times like the product placement feels out of place because a character that shouldn't be wearing like a high end luxury watch is wearing something that's a, you know, high end luxury watch or whatever. Um, that's just really not the case, you know, with this movie. Everyone is wearing a very humble watch that is kind of like built. Uh, you know, for the um, for the occasion, you know, which is like working in this like, you know, underwater, you know, like deep sea oil drinking uh, or oil drilling rig. Um, and the watches just kind of like make sense, whether it's a G-Shock or, uh, or Ed Harris's Seiko 6309. Um, and certainly with uh, with the catfish characters, Aqualand, um, you know, all of these watches, uh, you know, make sense in the context of the characters. And I think that that's really um uh, you know, kind of adds a lot of that, you know, authenticity that you were talking about to the to the movie. Uh, yeah, exactly. And and also, I think there's something to be said about this era of like, I, I don't know if it was that Citizen is pushing Seiko or Seiko is pushing Citizen. And probably both of them are doing that work together. But it really leads to a lot of innovation. Mm-hmm. You know, that the the depth gauge uh, sensor on the Aqualand at the time was really groundbreaking. And I I've never owned like a at least not recently. I can't even remember if I've ever owned an any digi watch. But like mm-hmm. I like the fact that this that that watch is is an any digi watch for a real purpose. You know, like yeah. that that depth gauge has a readout of um, based on water pressure and stuff like that. It's a really cool innovation that that was again. I think there was a lot of innovation happening between those two brands, pushing each other to get to that next level of like, what is a, the modern tool? And I think that's what we're talking about. These were all tool watches and they all feel like at home in this, in this world. Um, but like, I think I would, you know, that's a cool moment of seeing that, that kind of innovation being pushed forward, you know, at this yeah. moment in time. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to like think of some of a, like in terms of watches, something more like, iconic to this time period than an Anadigi 
sports watch. Yeah. Um, they'll just like, they'll just always look great, you know, in a, in a movie like this, in this, in this time period. And, um, and they're still really cool. Like they still, you know, um, you know, citizen and other brands, um, you know, still have success, you know, with the style of watch. Um, it's kind of, it, you know, it endures because of its simplicity, um, its functionality, and um, they just look great. I think it's as simple as that sometimes. Like they just, they, there's something aesthetically pleasing um, about these watches. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, the SEAL teams all sporting G Shocks, which, you know, I think this is a little bit before the full tactical uh, tactical style G Shocks we see today. But I guess it's a, it kind of does pre, uh, kind of predate that and is a precursor to what Citizen probably ended up excuse me, what Cassio ended up doing kind of in the world of, of, you know, tactical watches as well. So if it's, if it's those characters as well, and then, you know, any, yeah. any thoughts on, um, Mary Elizabeth's tag Hoyer formula one, it looks very like a dive watch to me, less of a formula one watch and more like a dive watch. Yeah. I mean, I think that that, so she plays a, uh, a character. We haven't really talked too much about her character. We talked about her, sure. you know, experience on this as an actress. Movie, like yeah. She's, yeah. She's, um, her character, I, I guess is like, an executive at this, you know, company in that a, makes this in kind of a science rig. scientist. Yeah, she has well. a science background, but like I get the yeah. sense that she's not like in the field, you know, as much yeah. as yeah. you know, like the Ed Harris character. Like she, you know, you picture her working in an office somewhere. And yeah, it's, I mean, you know, she's, like out she of knows place how initially. to like do stuff. She knows how to crank on bolts and drive the mini subs. So she's like yeah. definitely. The she's first time you see her, though, is she's she's like she's in a suit and she's wearing, yep, you know, exactly. like she's like well dressed and like you get the impression that she is like, you know, kind of like a, somewhat of an outsider coming into this like you know crew of like you know roughneck like oil drillers or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's the For impression sure. you kind of get. So I think like you know her watch kind of makes sense in that, uh, you know, in that sense a little bit more, bit more you know, a bit more formal. It's you know certainly you know more. Um, you know, this is an this is a time period where there were certainly like gendered, you know, watches, and that was yeah, more, exactly. and it's definitely more ladylike. Um, I think it suits the character, you know, perfectly fine. And you know, there's nothing more. This is an era where like the, the Tag Heuer brand is kind of like like the mall watch, you know, to mm. kind of like use a like a, a term that you know maybe some people would deride, but like you can like you can totally picture her like going into Macy's and like you know, like picking out the, like a nice watch for, you know, for the office or, or something. totally. It still is a sport watch though. And, and has those kind of toolish yeah. vibes. And I think it fits well. Um, yeah. I think this is a fun, a fun watch spotting movie, you know, when all said and done, if you're into watches, you'll, you'll have a blast with this, watching this particular film because they're, they're prominent. They're, they're, you know, they're not necessarily core to the storyline, but they're definitely utilized a few times. Um, and I think also, Again, if you have, if you're going to watch this movie, it's worth just watching the the behind the scenes where, again, the cast, excuse me, the crew who's filming this whole thing is wearing great watches in in the the behind the scenes doc as well. Yeah. So I think, again, I think we know that Cameron is is a watch guy. We know he is, yeah. and he and he makes that really clear through his films. We already had a podcast all about aliens and the the watches that he cast in that particular film. We could probably link up to that, Mm -hmm. that as well. But, you know, he made distinctive choices that again, you know, were current watches that were in, that were for sale, but that were cast in a way that looked like futuristic, which I think is, again, I love that idea of, of him taking existing things and then using, using them or, or nudging them into more fantastical you know, uh, places. Yeah, no, hundred percent. He's really good at that. Um, you know, he's kind of like a, I think like a master of setting and like, you know, making things feel like in a very specific way, you know, whether it's like recreating like the deck of the Titanic or, uh, you know, like a military operation against aliens or, uh, you know, an underwater environment. Like he really pays attention to the details in all of these, you know, in all these scenarios. And I think that's what makes him, um, you know, kind of an enduring filmmaker who's never, um, he's never made a movie that's like not a, you know, a financial success. You know, this movie's kind yeah. of like, it made a profit. It wasn't a huge success, but like, you know, look at his track record. He's made, you know, two movies by my count, at least that are, you know, we're the number one box office movie of all time, Yeah, you know, for, for quite some time. So yeah, exactly. um, credit, credit where credit is due. James Cameron knows how to like put the pieces together. And, uh, you know, part of that is, making sure that characters have the the appropriate watch on their wrist, I suppose. A small part, but it's part of it. 
Totally. And I wonder if you and I both need to finally see Piranha 2 and see if there's any watch moments in that one. Maybe that should be the next the next <laughs> version of this podcast, the Piranha 2 podcast. Oh boy, here we go. I don't yeah. I don't know. But he's made uh, some pretty famous to... I was gonna say he's made some pretty amazing sequels. I mean he's known for some of the two of the best sequels of all time. So maybe sure. Piranha 2 is is good. Who knows? Yeah. Um, maybe Piranha Three after he makes all of the uh, uh, all, all of these Avatar movies, he can come back and continue the the Piranha story. I'm game for it. Yeah. Um, well, so that's the Abyss, Kyle. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the podcast to talk about the Abyss. We'll have a lot more um, on the uh, on the website. Uh, thank you to cool. Citizen for sponsoring uh, the podcast, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>